In this episode, I'm once again joined by Dr. Ian A. Baker, International Fellow of the Explorers Club and the Royal Geographic Society, author of seven books and an initiate of Buddhist, Taoist and Hindu tantric lineages. In this interview, Ian recounts a life-changing encounter with a Shakta Tantric Siddha in Nepal, who healed Ian of severe climbing injuries and initiated him into the Kaula Tantric Order. Ian compares the hitherto secret practices of this sect, such as pranayama, asana, and kundalini techniques, with their Tibetan Tantric equivalents. Ian reveals the surprising reactions of his Tibetan teachers, including Chatra Rinpoche and Tulku Urgen Rinpoche, to his initiation into Kaula Tantra and shares a drinking practice taught to him by his Kaula Guru. Ian also discusses Himalayan Bayul, the thin places of the Scottish Highlands, and how a trip to the Isle of Skye brought him into living contact with local fairy lore. So without further ado, Dr. Ian A. Baker. Dr. Ian Baker, welcome back to the podcast. Wonderful to be here. The last time we spoke was February of last year, 2020. And uh, it's been quite a year since then. So first of all, I'm curious, how has this last year been for you? What have you been working on in terms of your current writing, your research projects and curation, etc.? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly uh, it's been a, a, a sea change in the world uh, since we last spoke. And I think at that time I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I'll actually be again uh, in a week's time. But essentially, since that time, I've been here in Scotland, up in the Highlands, which has been a wonderful, I mean, I really couldn't think of, of having had a better place for a lockdown. Um, and it's been very, in my, from, from myself personally, it's been a very fruitful time. It allowed me to really focus on work and, um, and writing projects and, you know, a variety of sort of upcoming um, projects that have been... Uh, yeah, in brewing for a while, but really needed, in my case, the kind of isolation and lack of travel that the lockdown, at least in, in, for me, provided. So, yeah, in that sense, it's been a, uh, it hasn't been a, in any way a, a, a bad experience on a personal level, although certainly, well, as we emerge from it, you know, it's, it's going to be a new world that we enter into. Can you give us any sneak previews or glimpses of some mm. of the things that you've been working on uh, without uh, interrupting the creative process somehow. No, not at all. Um, I'm trying to think back on where we spoke last time. Yeah, when I was, um, yeah, I think when we spoke and I was in Santa Fe, I was just about to go off back to Asia, which I did. And I was at that time, went back to India, went back to, um, to Burma, where I was working on a project there on Burmese alchemy, looking at, again, these the more esoteric aspects of, of Buddhist Theravada. And I had planned to be back there this whole last winter. So that is something that in a certain sense has been suspended because of now the really tragic circumstances in Burma. I don't know when I'll get back there or when Burma will become a place that one can even really travel to again. But that has been at the same time since we last spoke, something that has increasingly engaged me, which is looking at how um, esoteric Buddhist practice, whether it's Vajrayana or even Theravada, uh, in this case of Bur in the case of Burma, has um, used supportive substances to enhance um, yogic, meditative, contemplative practices. And as I think we spoke about perhaps briefly last time, you know, in the Burmese tradition, it's working with essentially what in India would be called Rasayana, Rasa Shastra, working with transformed mercury, which is recognized as being highly toxic, and yet when it's worked with uh, constructively. Uh, and alchemically uh, turns into a great elixir. So I've been working on that. And then also in, related to that, working on other aspects of, of um, again, supportive substances. I'm doing a, a chapter, which I just finished the rough draft of yesterday. Uh, so it's kind of quite timely on Soma, on the kind of ancient <laughs> elixir of the Vedic tradition. And, you know, which has been, of course, a quest for, uh, ever since it came into scholarly attention in the West in the 18th century, you know, the quest of Vedic scholars and historians um, and, uh, you know, anthropologists or ethnographers rather and botanists to understand what is Soma, and you know, whether it was a single plant or a complex of plants um, has been, um, you know, an ongoing quest. But what was very, very interesting for me, and this goes back now three years ago when I was in India, and again, uh, kind of looking into the sources um, of Indian Tantra, let's say, and how that, how that was 
altered, perhaps one could say, even in its in its uh, translation over the Himalayas into Tibet. I came across the living tradition of Soma uh, practice in Tarapit, one of the great tantric power places in Bengal. And that was connected to this Kaula, Kaula Mark tradition, uh, which has also been very much part of my uh, spiritual path, if you will. Uh, and what I found fascinating, which I hadn't realized before from one of my a teacher there, uh, Ananda Tirtanath, is that you know within their tradition, connected to the uh, tradition of Tara in particular, there's a, a living tradition of, of Soma, uh, production and consumption and ritual procedures connected to it with 64 different ingredients. So I'm just finishing a paper for MIT Press, uh, which will be a chapter in a book that's coming out next year called A Global History of Psychedelics. So this will be looking essentially at what we could almost call psychedelic mysticism in, in the early, in the Indian Tantras. So that's been kind of what I've been up till literally last night when I finished the first draft of this chapter, what I've been kind of engaged with. And um, yeah, going forward, as I said, this summer is gonna be a little different and I go back to the States for the first time since we last spoke. Um, and uh, that's sort of essentially to, to feel things out in the outer world again, after a year of, of um, a more insulated existence. I'd like to ask you actually about some of the points you raised, but mm -hmm. I'm also a little curious, of course, you're not only a scholar, but also a practitioner. And I'm curious if you, as some people have said they have done, if you have taken this year of somewhat more isolation mm. to deepen or explore any particular practices, or have you engaged in any explorations of that nature? Or has the focus predominantly been in terms of the extra energy on your scholarly uh, research pursuits? Mm -hmm. No, no, that's, the, that's a very relevant question. Obviously, um, again, I was referring when, when uh, I answered the question more to the outer uh, activities, but certainly it has been, you know, as I said, I'm in a rather wonderful circumstances being up in a up in the highlands where lockdown basically meant having free range of the moors and mountains and you know and uh, forests behind me so you know where no one else was so it's been uh, in that sense I almost felt like I was in a, a wilderness in the best sense of the word uh, in sense of the purity of nature here so that allowed me to to really deepen practice in terms of um, engagement with with, with support of the natural world, because I said I have literally a, you know, this great stream coming down from the Cairngorms right behind the house. And, you know, so I've been but sort of re-engaging with some of these more elemental practices, working with the elements of water and, uh, and earth. Um, and uh, so a lot of those practices are, as we spoke about before, uh, you know, through my teacher, Tatra Rinpoche, who was, although obviously, you know, Dzogchen, master and uh, very much at the, the nintik or hard essence tradition of Vajrayana was himself very much engaged with as his teacher and my first group guru um, Dujarin Bashe had been in dialogue with with Shaiva masters and uh, and Dujarin Bashe, which is probably even less well known uh, was very much engaged with uh, in discussions in terms of technique with uh, a very prominent Kaula uh, Shaiva teacher and uh this is what i find you know for myself very interesting and also as i've been uh been instructed by my teachers is not to limit one's practice to what we find within a particular lineage but actually to to really discern the essence of what any of these traditions are in a sense you know the supreme consciousness if you will the illumination that they're all speaking towards and in that sense, the techniques themselves refine over time through dialogue and self-experimentation. So yeah, that's sort of a long way of answering your question that yes, this was a, was a great opportunity to, to really engage in, uh, in a more focused practice, um, working with, with uh, yeah, these, these core techniques. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And you're teasing the Hindu and Buddhist uh, mm -hmm. dialogue on, in, on the tantric level. And it's something that I'd certainly as we discussed, would, would really like to dive into with you. Uh, your episode, episode 23 of the Guru Viking podcast has been one of the most stimulating in terms of discussion, comments, and emails. And uh, I'm going to, in this interview, certainly fire away with quite a number of follow-up questions from that episode. We discussed last time about 
your fascination, perhaps obsession, with Bayul, hidden places, uh, mm. spiritually significant or spiritually conducive places, often very secluded. And you wrote about that extensively in uh, your book, The Heart of the World. You also refer to Bayul as thin places, which mm. from what I understand is something of a Celtic term. I'm curious if in your exploring of the highlands mm. um, and places like that, if you are sensitive to or looking for or encountering uh, hidden places in that sort of a context, places, special places that you, you like to practice, if so, how do you detect them or select them? And I'm also curious what the sort of elemental practices you might engage in connecting with water and connecting with earth and so on. I'm curious what that, that practice might look like if you are willing to discuss it. Absolutely. Well, no, it's a very timely question in the sense that, you know, once lockdown, essentially, well, Scotland opening up, which I think was a little bit after England, uh, my first destination was the island of Skye. And a good friend of mine, who has also uh, been a long-term practitioner, very engaged with a, with a Dzogchen master in Bhutan, uh, he and his wife came up by train, picked them up in Inverness, we went over to Skye, and spent an incredible week where I didn't open my computer, uh, blessed with extraordinary weather, and went deep into the, you know, the Black Kulin, these mountains, of course, which Kulin comes from the Norse word, as I'm sure you're aware, meaning the keel of a, of a longboat, of a Viking ship. And so as the Kulin look to be, when you see them, especially in sort of sky weather, uh, it looks like an overturned uh, Norse longship. But what was extraordinary with the weather we had, it allowed us to explore um, that range in a way that I'd never had before. And often when I'd been there in the past, you know, just enveloped in mist and rain, which of course is its own, has its own magic. But on this occasion, we had really extraordinary weather that allowed us uh, to go into a place that had been particularly something on my uh, wish list for a very long time, which is this Loch Kursk, which is a loch, uh, sea loch on the southern coast, southeastern coast of which has been written about by Robert McFarlane and others, and has been a place of almost pilgrimage uh, for many in the past because of the uh, mysterious, uh, well, first of all, the physical beauty of it at the base of the Coolins and right at the edge of the sea, but also because of a kind of numinous, numinosity that it seems to have. So the opportunity to go there, as we did, um, and, and do some practice, um, again, integrating with that place, as well as on, on the Kulin Ridge itself, we were able to get up to the highest peak, the Spur Alistair, up to, uh, you know, which is an extraordinary route up what's called the Great Stone Chute. So all of that was rather wonderful. It made me feel times that I was back in the Himalayas, um, just because of the, you know, the extreme, you know, the top part of that, uh, of the Kulin Ridge is often, you know, uh, scrambling, let's just say, in the sense that, you know, unroped, but where you have to be very, very present and mindful to, to avoid, uh, an unwanted, uh, abrupt des descent, let's just say. So anyway, it was a wonderful opportunity to be immersed back in, in uh, a very, very powerful and elemental nature, uh, where there's also, you know, to allude to your other, you know, a very strong tradition of the fairy faith, in a sense, which is that Celtic sense of places where the world is thin. And so part of that, our, one of our roots went through a place called the Fairy Glen, in that way, where I'm, I, we were, both my friends and I were quite convinced we were sort of coming upon human emanations of pixies and <laughs> other elementals. I mean, it is a wonderful place where I think, again, it's what we bring to places that allow those places to express themselves in their full potential. So, of course, any place we can go into and it doesn't touch us necessarily. But if we're predisposed to, to think and feel and orient our minds in a particular way, then those places um, uh, speak to us. And again, we can enter into dialogue, not just with you know, the human emanations of the place, but also the non-human dimensions. And that's certainly, you know, again, to answer the other part of your question where certain practices uh, can further that process of thinning, if you will, where those veils between worlds, um, which are already, in some ways thinner at these places as we, we think of in the, in the Celtic world, uh, where one begins to find techniques and mechanisms to move out of the mind as we 
conventionally experience it into a kind of transpersonal space in which the mind no longer interferes with, with a kind of uh, transcendent perception, let's just say. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, I will ask, when yeah. you say that your friends and yourself were convinced that you were able to perceive uh, human emanations of the fairy folk, so to say. What do you mean by that? Phenomenologically, I, I'm not necessarily asking you to justify it in some sort of scientific sense. No, no, no. Well, I, I have to sort of probably interrupt you there and just to simply say that, you know, I, we mean it somewhat. It was really on the first day when we were simply asking for directions. Um, and the directions were, were, were paradoxical and um, at the same time, charmingly uh, conveyed by, by someone we were absolutely, the three of us, spontaneously convinced was a emanation, but uh, yeah, not literally, but uh, but at, after that point, we had something that we called pixie logic. And that was really what uh, in some ways became a, an orienting metaphor for our, um, our experience on sky. And it also allowed us, which was very interesting, you know, whether it was in inns and taverns at the evening and, you know, with wonderful locals who were serving. Also, particularly my friend's wife was just very engaged with, you know, she'd done her her doctoral work and uh, her graduate work on on romantic poetry in, in the University of Edinburgh. So she was very interested in what the local lore was in terms of understanding. And so that led to extremely interesting you know, dialogues where you know, it wasn't something that the usual person serving you in a restaurant in Sky was being asked. And so, in other words, yeah, a different a layer of of um, of sky kind of emerged uh, in that process and you know deeply influenced as we know also from the early viking culture uh, that um, yeah, so it's a very nordic uh, world as much as it is uh, you know gaelic and celtic so um yeah that's really all i meant by it simply was again this way of what we bring to a place even in the questions that we ask of those who are there will bring out a different layer of experience you know mm. so rather than asking about brexit and how you know how tourism was was functioning you know we had we had more interesting questions of whether they'd seen things you know in in the you know besides the you know the the sheep that are everywhere on the island and so that led as i said to sort of interesting accounts of of a population that is certainly as it appeared to us sort of open to this idea that the world that we see is just uh one layer of uh, that work with other dimensions behind it. And that goes back, you know, very much to, as you were saying before, my the interest that I had in Beu, the hidden lands, as they're you can roughly translate in the, in the Himalayan tradition, where that is particularly uh, overt, that idea that the pilgrimage to the hidden land is very specifically about trying to move out of a particular way of seeing into a more inclusive perception that um, in which those conventional boundaries between outer and inner and secret and so-called don't don't pertain. Mm, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned uh, a little earlier about your research into the esoteric practices in Burma, present in Burma, mm. and uh, both in a, a Theravadan context and also a Vajrayana context, and also the use of substances. It's an area of substances that you have had quite a history of research into for quite some time. You write about it in your book, The Heart of the World, uh, over the past year, my study of alchemical elixirs in the Tibetan Tantras had brought exotic substances into my kitchen larder. Concoctions of lotus seeds and wild honey, sautéed caterpillar fungus, Indian snake root, and preparations made from pure and gold became a regular part of my and Hamid's diet. Hamid is your colleague from uh, the heart of the world, which we just will recognize him. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, often when people think of, say, Burma, people think oh. of Theravada, and people think of the Vinaya, and one of the core vows of even lay Buddhist practice is swearing off intoxications of various kinds. Yeah. Also, people think of Burma, people think of Theravada, people do not think of esoteric practices. Mm -hmm. I think this is commonly done. Now, can you explain that misconception? Perhaps give a glimpse as, as to how uh, substances uh, may have been a a, a more crucial part of Buddhist history than is recognized. Are you familiar? I'm sure you are with, um, I'm thinking of Mike Crowley's book. Yes. Uh, the Secret Drugs of Buddhism. Drugs of Buddhism, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in that book, 
everything's to do with mushrooms. And yeah. uh, so which is it? Is it, a, is it a mushroom cult with a thousand arms about the Kiteshvara, uh, the yeah. underside of a mushroom? Or is it, no, it's actually an austere tradition of uh, no intoxications and so on. Can you unravel a little bit that? Yeah, a little bit. I can speak to, let's say, particularly in Burma, but, but we'll start with that in the sense that it is a place that's, you know, for the most part understood as a very, as a place of Buddhist orthodoxy. In other words, strict adherence to the Vinaya, the monastic vows, which include not just for monastics, but technically for anyone really following the Buddhist path, the avoidance of intoxicants, or as that's more often, or well, not more often, but, but nuanced as to avoid intoxication. So that's the subtle difference that say in Gurdjieff's work, for example, with, you know, where he referred to, you know, with drinking was the, as it was indeed for Plato in the original symposiums, um, actually getting your students drunk was the best way to find out their true qualities of their mind. And so symposia, as we know, um, were originally drinking, uh, you know, you could say erudite drinking parties in which the mind loosened from its kind of conventional, uh, uh, what do you say, inhibitions allowed, you know, a deeper level of the personality to emerge that then the teacher uh, could work with um, in terms of to guide the student more deeply. So that's, we see that of course, in you know, the Hellenic pagan tradition, and we see it certainly the Dionysian tradition, and we certainly see it in, in Vajrayana Buddhism, which was in a sense, let's say, which I'll come back to, but kind of an emergence from the Vajrayana, an emergence from the Vinaya, because, you know, as great contemporary masters, such as Sokchan Ponlap Rinpoche has said, you know, Vajrayana was not made for monks. <laughs> They can practice it, but only by a certain kind of um, uh, intellectual athleticism in which you kind of recast and reinterpret um, the iconography as well as the texts in order to make them conform to monastic vows. But it's a very, it's, it, it involves, I think, as we spoke last time, a certain kind of cognitive um, dissonance is, is involved in that process because it, you know, there are many things that are just strictly forbidden uh, in the Vinaya that the Vajrayana texts are very explicit about uh, being necessary for the path of true liberation, where we're, no, we're not liberated within a state of renunciation, but we're liberated within a state of engagement and expansion. So, so to go, but, but first to start with Burma, because I think it's a very interesting way to look at it. We know that up until the 11th century or the 10th century with King Anuwata, there was a tantric Buddhist tradition in northern Burma in particular, particularly as northern Burma, Bagan, Mrokou, these were all on a direct um, trade route between northeastern India and Assam in particular and Bengal with southwestern China and Yunnan province. And so, and the, you know, the kingdom, there were you know, uh, kingdoms in, in, which were very, very tantric in, in southwestern China. So not unsurprisingly, there was a very strong tantric Buddhist uh, tradition in, uh, in Northern Burma that King Anduatta at that time basically outlawed uh, and enforced uh, the, the whole Burma, if we want to call it that as a unified, you know, beginnings of a unified kingdom and to follow Theravada. So in other words, a strict monastic code. However, uh, the Ari the tradition, as it was called, um, they were called Ari monks, they dressed in black, they, they drank wine, they, they consorted with, with women, um, and they practiced alchemy. So what we see in that, and that's, that's a, a known uh, uh, historical fact in Burma, but very little has been explored about the Ari tradition, except for the fact that this tradition of alchemy, or Agia, as it's called in, in, in Burma, is, is considered to be kind of what continued. Um, and that was because it was able to focus on a very specific soteriological kind of goal of, of spiritual liberation through the use of, of uh, essentially of the datong, which was uh, these essence, um, of these mercury balls that were that they refer to even uh, in Burma now as kind of the philosopher's stone. And so it's a fascinating tradition in which working with, um, and it wasn't, wasn't just mercury, so as my research there showed, uh, particularly up until actually after we last spoke, when I went back to Burma again, I was working with a particular alchemist there, and this is why I was sort of disappointed on one level not to be able to be there this winter, because we had planned, and it connects also to this tradition of the, of the hidden lands. So there's a place 
um, or let's say a dimension or a, a Burma called Mahamyayi, which means the great forest. And it's kind of equivalent to a Beu in the Tibetan tradition. And according to this one alchemist who I had known on, and met on several occasions before, but who only on that last trip, which was last beginning of last um, February, uh, a year ago, uh, spoke of these sort of four gates into this Mahamyayi, because it was always a question of, you know, where is this place located? How do you get to it? And that there were also um, plants that functioned as keys to it. And it was the first time that I'd really heard direct evidence that he because it was at, at his place and he had all these jars of honey with different kinds of plants and roots infused in it. But it allowed, it was the first time where I kind of confessed that, you know, some of the, they did actually have a tradition of both um, psychedelic mushrooms and uh, and actual roots with psychoactive properties that were used esoterically within their tradition of um, a waisa, what, what they call the waisa lamb. So waisa seems to be in Burmese a local pronunciation of vidyadara. So the vidyadara essentially a tantric term meaning the you know the holders of wisdom in the Vajrayana tradition. So the Waisar was is this kind of um, parallel tradition to, to Burmese uh, Theravada. Um, and so Waisar practitioners can be monks, um, but of a definitely of an esoteric nature. And they can also be uh, non-ordained, or let's say not as monks, but certainly initiates in the Waisa tradition, which is an esoteric, certainly, uh, has its roots in, in esoteric, we could even say tantric Buddhism. And so that uh, you know, is fascinating because it also relates to Mahamyaya functions in the same way in, for example, in Northeastern India, across the border in Assam, there's a tradition among the Kaula tradition and teachers that I had there, what they call Gyan Ganj, uh, Gyan meaning you know, wisdom uh, or knowledge, and Ganj, the place, this place of secret knowledge. And it definitely is a, it kind of again overlaps with the tradition of the Siddh Ashram, which is this kind of uh, semi-legendary uh, place of 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 uh, practice and revelation somewhere in the eastern Himalayas. That definitely connects with some of the traditions connected with Pemaka. So I just feel this whole northeastern part of um, the Indian subcontinent um, shares in different local variations of of a of a hidden place where the world is, you know, as we were talking about it before, thin in the sense where particular practices are more efficacious and where there are particular plants and substances that can be used in support of actually furthering that sense of a dissolution of um, any kind of rigid perceptual boundary between what we tend to think of in just on a functional basis of, you know, the internal world and the external world, uh, but that consciousness becomes something far more um, transcendent of that, of that rather illusory binary that even uh, Einstein referred to as an optical illusion of consciousness. So that's, that's certainly um, yeah, there within the Burmese tradition, but as, as you've said, it's just not something that has, you know, normally with Burma, we think either of kind of an orthodox Buddhism, or we think of the rather you know, tragic and ongoing uh, kind of political and socio-political circumstances there. Mm. Yeah. Do you have a take on uh, Mike Crowley's book, The Secret Drugs of Buddhism? Yeah, I mean, it's here on my shelf. <laughs> and I, th yeah, I think there's some very interesting things in there, but I think a lot of it needs to be kind of rigorously, I think there's elements of it that are speculative leaps that aren't that, that are more, um, yeah, unfortunately, I do, I do feel that there's quite a lot there that that's almost like a free association um, between suggestive imagery and, um, and then, yeah, making claims that I'm not sure are rigorously supported by, by the evidence, certainly not textually. Um, and of course, that's the beauty of art is that we can read into it what we want. Um, however, I think there's, uh, I think it was a recent Michael Winkleman, I think did an interesting review of the, of Crowley's book and it's support and in which his own work, uh, which I think was even done, was published in 2019, where they actually looking at, at, um, mushroom symbolism and the erotic sculptures of Kajiraho, for example, uh, and, uh, 
I, he, I'm sorry, he did that with, uh, it was a, uh, that was a paper that he did in, with, together with a, a female scholar whose name is eluding me at the moment. But that makes some rather convincing arguments uh, that are almost um, inescapable of the mushroom symbolism at Kajuraho, which we tend to think of mostly for its erotic art. But the degree to which the eroticism is uh, under underlain by um, by a very clear uh, uh, mushroom um, iconography, I think, is fascinating. And this particular this symbolism of this figure eight, which is there. So I think you know it, it's something I I plan to kind of delve more into to look at both where uh, Finkelman's critique for Crowley's work um, is nonetheless supported. And this is also where Winkleman's work is interesting because it just it does relate to the work that I've been doing recently on soma. So soma, of course, being this kind of elixir of the gods, you know, first invoked in the Rig Veda, and certainly the first evidence of a kind of link between pharmacology and religion. Um, but as we as we mentioned, you know, the the actual nature of soma as either a single psychoactive substance or a combination of syncretic substances has been long debated. And of course, back in the 60s, it was you know, Gordon Wasson who promoted the idea that it was Amanita muscaria. Uh, then later, you know, people like Terence McKenna claiming it was probably more likely um, you know, psilocybin. Uh, but the whole, and then uh, more recent work again by, um, um, by Matthew Clark at SOAS has also shown, you know, again, evidence that you know, mushrooms were not necessarily involved. Uh, but nonetheless, a number of different syncretic substances, possibly some of them having both the monoamine um, oxidase inhibitors and the DMT, dimethyltryptamine containing plants, possibly in combination uh, to produce, you know, what he's referring to kind of as an Asian analog of ayahuasca, or even what was called now, I think, coined the term of, of somawaska. So this idea that we're looking at a whole complex of, uh, of substances. So I think that uh, it's very important that Mike Crowley produced uh, the book that he did, but I think it needs definitely, I think some rigorous um, scholarship uh, that can use that as a, as a basis for, for going deeper into it and uh, looking at the evidence both in texts and, uh, and iconography. And of course, as is most important in these traditions, the oral tradition, because although oral tradition allows for change and things to be remembered differently over time, it's also something that's really paramount within the tantric traditions, which were never primarily, I mean, we know that from, you know, the Zen tradition was a special transmission outside the scriptures, but that was very much true of Tantra as well, where we have texts that sort of through twilight language uh, refer to key doctrines, but it's always that relationship with the teacher that brings out the true meaning. So uh, that's a long way of answer, you know, trying to address the question that I think it's fascinating to, to um, that all of this kind of material is coming out now uh, to look at the ways in which uh, psychoactive substances can be used both to uh, support uh, transformational practices and at the same time how working with the body breath and the mind in specific ways can also um, bring out the full potential of these kind of substances that have otherwise in our own Western tradition since the 60s at least been used more in a, more often in a more recreational exploratory sense, but not often used in conjunction with a particular kind of either guided meditation as the case is now with psilocybin in terms of its work, its function as a in mental health, uh, but more powerfully even for eliciting mystical experience. Uh, by combining you know, even, even small amounts of these substances with particular breath, breathing techniques and, and uh, mental training. Oh, fascinating. In our previous interview, you mentioned having been initiated into the Kaula tradition and proceeded to give a remarkable account of aspects of your training in Maituna with your assigned consort Uma Devi under the tutelage of the guru of that community. You know, I mentioned that that episode, uh, episode 23, was so uh, stimulating in terms of discussion. Mm -hmm. And I received so many questions. And this area in particular was one of those areas. People were so fascinated mm -hmm. by your account and have been demanding <laughs> that I ask you more about it. So can you give us a sense of what the Kaula tradition is, how you became interested in it, 
mm. and then how you became involved in that group specifically. Yeah, just sort of looking first historically to understand Kaula. So Kaula, obviously a Sanskrit word that is often also synonymous with Kula. Kula can mean clan, it can mean family. It can, in a certain Buddhist sense, mean Sangha in the sense of a very intentional uh, alternate community of practitioners working closely together with, with the guru as a kind of almost uh, um, father figure or a mother figure. Uh, certainly, certainly gurus were both male and female. So the idea of Kula or Kaula is a very, very intentional group working very, very closely together in a very... Um, often with, with secret practices. It was often called the secret practice, the kaula. And kaulika, which was, is often, which is in a sense the, um, you know, a further derivation of the word kaula is the often held to be synonymous with the kundalini. So it's basically this, um, this supreme consciousness that arises through the activation of this kind of somatic wisdom that's there in potential within our embodied being and yet which is brought about through the kinds of um, not just embodied practices but the partnered practices that can really bring about this dynamic transformation and um, so why kaula fascinated me was i knew you know from my own my first when i was first in nepal in 1977 and then with um uh, with, with Dujer Rinpoche and then later with Chatra Rinpoche, who was one of his close the students and disciples. And who, as we spoke about uh, last year, just passed away a few years ago at 102 years old or 103 by Tibetan reckoning. Um, both of them were deeply engaged with, with Shaivism, with the Kaula tradition in the sense that they consulted with. They had, and I was very aware, aware of that with Chatra Rinpoche in particular, even accompanying him to you know, on Shiva Ratri, the, the day of Shiva, you know, to Pashupati and, and also at his various retreat centers, there were often sort of hidden shrines, not really hidden, but just kind of, you know, on the side of Shiva Lingams and Shiva imagery, and uh, also very aware of practitioners of the Shaiva traditions and Shakta traditions who would often come to see Chatra Rinpoche. Uh, some of those, you know, being not well-known, but certainly prominent uh, uh, Shakta masters from India, like Kula Vaduta, you know, who uh, Chatra Rinpoche worked with um, and instructed to write on on the kind of real origins of uh, of um, Buddhist Tantra uh, in the way that it intersected with with uh, the the what we could talk, call in a larger sense the Hindu Tantra. And so the, all of that made me very. And then this was it Rampersad, that you know, again prominent. Um, highly revered uh, Hindu Shaiva masters who, who Chatra Rinpoche, as well as Jujum Rinpoche, had also interacted with. So I was very intrigued um, by this kind of, essentially where did Tibetan Buddhism come from? It came from India, it came from these tantric traditions. We also know that, you know, in the earliest uh, lineages that, uh, of Tibetan Buddhism, it all came from basically non-monastic, non-celibate, uh, Mahasiddhas, male and female, and that gradually, as we sort of see that transition to Tibet, it became gradually, you know, these, these practices and traditions and lineages became monasticized. So if we look, for example, at the Kargyu tradition in the 11th century, we see this uh, you know, Tilopa, who was the, you know, kind of this wild yogi, you know, living the banks of the river, who Naropa, who had been a dean of uh, at Nalanda, but who left that um, in favor of a more inclusive uh, knowledge that was not available. You know, he was inspired, as we know, by that story. I think we spoke of last time, inspired by a Dakini who, uh, who was masquerading as the as the as the um, um, person cleaning his sweeping his room, but then who flew out the window at the end after directing him towards. Um, her brother, as as, he, as she described it, according to one of the texts. Um, and we also know that Tilopa, uh, again, different versions of these stories, but that uh, one of his great teachers was said to have been this green Dakini from the land of Uyana, which is the, the in a certain sense, the, the place where the, the Tantras are said to have originated in the northwest frontiers of India on the ancient Silk Roads between Anatolia uh, in, 
Turkey and you know towards Central Asia. So that being a, a fascinating area that we, we can speak about later, because I think it really goes to the heart of these traditions. Um, but I think you know what's what's relevant here is that I was increasingly you know although I'd been exposed first to to Tibetan Buddhism in Kathmandu, the teachers that I was just karmically or um, innately drawn to were were non monastic. I mean, so uh, Dujar Rinpoche, Chato Rinpoche, Hupu Gyun, um, Dingu Kensu Rinpoche, all in the so called Nyingma tradition. Nyingma tradition, of course, uh, based tracing itself to to Padma Sambhava, uh, who was anything but a monastic with his <laughs> his consorts in Tibet and India, Mandurava and uh, and Tibet, and we know also, of course, the Ashit Sogyal uh, in Tibet is probably the one who's most associated with because of the hiding of the spiritual treasures and texts that later became the, the kind of uh, textual basis for the Nyingma tradition. But prior to that, um, you know, was his, his link with, with the Indian princess Mandurava, who was not just a consort, but a teacher as well. And there's certainly texts now indicating more and more just the degree to which Mandurava was a, you know, was a great tantric, you know, guru master herself. And so part of, and we also know prior to that, in, when Padma Sambhava left the palace, paralleling, you know, experience that the Buddha had, having to leave the palace for a, a greater, you know, to expand his horizons, you know, then he had this, you know, his first guru was this whole, um, uh, Kungama in, the, you know, in one of the cremation grounds where there's, again, in symbolic language, a, a union that took place that, that uh, opened him to um, you know, the innate uh, wisdom of his own uh, being. So what we see you know, really at the roots, let's say, of the Nyingma tradition, the oldest tradition of Tibetan Buddhism is a completely non-monastic uh, tradition of, of very much partnered um, practices working to to bring about a transformation of these somatic energies, passion, uh, and working in a way uh, where those passions are transformed spontaneously through that uh, those processes into what's conventionally called bodhicitta or um, you know compassion, altruistic intention. But this is simply because I think the Buddhist tradition. Is uncomfortable with the word love <laughs> but i think that's something that we can speak to because it's something very prominent you know actually in the kaula tradition and i think the problem is in buddhism is that because it began as a renunciatory you know shravaka tradition where you kind of left all that behind and we have that just so implicit in the buddha's own so-called life story of you know having to tiptoe his way out of the harem and just sort of look down at his wife and his child as he abandoned them for the forests um not that there wasn't love but there was this sense of renunciation of those areas of potential entanglement uh, that could lead to the kinds of samsaric um, patterning that we had in, in, you know, that we see in the so-called Four Noble Truths that he presented to those who had, like him, renounced the world. And I think, you know, this idea that that um, that suffering is largely due to the kind of thirst and passions that we have that that bring us into those kinds of um, circumstances. But I think the beauty to me of the Vajrayana or the Tantric tradition of Buddhism that grew, that, that developed over subsequent centuries was that it was in a sense an implicit critique of this renunciatory model and rather said that no, if for a more complete sense of enlightenment and illumination, we need to actually uh, not just transform those passions, but we need to integrate with them. Otherwise we're living, you know, this is not the non-dual reality uh, that we're, we're speaking about, but actually it's, it's a kind of conditional non-duality, which is still based upon a, a break from the phenomenal world that in a certain sense, monasticism uh, represents. So although that can be a powerful foundation for, for, for spiritual illumination and practice, it wasn't what, um, what inspired me. And I was inspired by the model of, of Padma Sambhava, you know, in Mandurava, Yeshe Sogyal. I was inspired by the example of my own teachers who themselves had families, uh, sons and daughters. And I was inspired by the fact that they were not just open to, but had also gained and and spoke to me about the the um the importance of the the indian 
uh, sources, the original uh, Indian tantric sources. Um, and so one thing that I think we also spoke about last year was that when I had asked, for example, Chatra Rinpoche, you know, about the incredible collection of um, Buddhist uh, material that had been translated into Tibetan, you know, which was over, which is overwhelming. I said, you know, what is the most important? Uh, he goes, well, you know, if you can understand them, the only thing you need to read are the the songs of spiritual realization, the doas of the the the, the eighty four Mahasiddhas of the tantric masters, which included both male and female. Uh, teachers. And so that was always something very inspiring to me, um, because it essentially what he was pointing to is that Tantra, uh, even in this case, in the context of, of, of Dzogchen, as he had being one of the greatest exemplars of, um, was really not to be, the essence was not to be looked for in the monastic tradition, it was be, to be looked for in the lives and uh, liberating instructions and songs of, of these Tantric masters. Um, that are often codified as 84, but certainly were, that, that's in some ways even as other teachers would say, you know, as an arbitrary number, but there are 84 who are in a sense canonized. And only four of those being women, although we know that there were many more, for example, in Ludhiana of, uh, of uh, female Mahasiddhas. Um, but I think what's important there is that to recognize that um, some of these so-called uh, Buddhist Mahasiddhas are also held to be uh, siddhas in the Kaula tradition. So in other words, in the Tantric Hindu tradition. So there's clear overlap between the traditions and clear overlap, not just in terms of revered um, figures, but also in terms of the, the core techniques that are shared between the traditions. So I think that that's something that I think, um, you know, is, is really important as we kind of move forward in our understanding of, you know, where did, you know, what are the Indian, uh, tantric roots of, uh, of, of Tibetan iteration of Vajrayana, um, but essentially what are these core techniques that are shared between the Shaiva, you know, the Shiva, the Shaiva Shakti tradition and the, uh, the Anuttara Yoga uh, and Dzogchen traditions in Tibet. So that's, that's something we can, we can, I don't know if that answered your question. There's a lot more I could, I could continue talking on the subject, but uh, I'll just finish it off by just saying that um, you know, if we look at, you know, what does Padma Sambhava and his, you know, we see him normally sort of paired with either Yeshi Tsogyal or Mandarava often in Yapyum. And what we see there, I think, is a, is a clear Buddhist parallel to Bhairava and Bhairavi. You know, so Bhairava, as it's explained orally, at least in the, in the Kaula tradition, is the state of emancipated passion that results from Maituna from sexual yoga. So Bhairava Bhairavi is this, you know, ex exalted state that, as we can see with Bhairava, is often considered said to be fierce, but it's really a passionate state, an intensification of consciousness and uh, self-transcendent consciousness when passion transforms, as the Kaula tradition will say, you know, into to self-transcendent love. And I think this is, this is what inspires me in the Kaula tradition, is that it's not just the way in some in monastic contexts, the way you know we've seen so much, unfortunately, in the Tibetan Buddhist world, where uh, teachers will try to reconcile their so-called monastic vows with the fact that the Tantra Buddhist Tantra still prescribes prescribes sexual practice, and so all of that has to be done surreptitiously, hidden, non-transparently, and resulting in the kind of confusion, scandals, and uh, debasing of the tradition that, you know, that we've seen over the last few years, particularly uh, as a tradition that was dependent on secrecy, uh, comes increasingly into kind of uh, intersects with, with contemporary uh, demand for transparency and, and openness, and I think productively so. But what it does expose is this kind of, even as one you know, great, I won't mention his name, but a very highly Real, you know, recognized uh, Tibetan masters is this is just monastic Vajrayana is just institutionalized hypocrisy. So that's a rather bold statement, but that's not mine, it's his. Um, but he says, yeah, monks just, there is no real place for it, you know. And the way that the monastic tradition dealt with it was that in the so called sacred time, uh, the um, Duchen, as it would be called in Tibet, and even in, in the context of, of initiation and particularly in the third initiation in Vajrayana, which demanded sexual union, uh, that it would be, you know, the way that that was achieved 
uh, in a monastic context was just in a ritual context in which you probably, uh, you know, a, a poor monk who might have been otherwise completely celibate and unexposed to this kind of thing would have a, a, a numinous, sometimes momentous uh, experience through that union, but it might have been in the context of old Tibet, you know, a village girl, you know, who was brought in for the purposes who then was sent home afterwards. He never knew her name. There was no love. There was no actual, this was, it was almost hydraulic in its, in its limitations. It was, would certainly be psychologically transformative, but not necessarily always, I would say, in a particularly good way. And I think this is, and you know, that's, that's a, obviously, you know, can have seminars based upon that, you know, what was actually happening in the context where, as I've heard from, you know, one Tibetan um, teacher and long-term practitioner, many retreats, you know, where he was engaged with, um, you know, with a, still with a consort, practice, consort several. And then I said, well, you know, what was their name? Because well, I don't, I don't need to know their name. That would just lead to attachment. So this fear of attachment, which I think is pathological sometimes in, in Buddhism, particularly in a context of Ajayana, is you just don't have this. It doesn't come into play in the Kaula tradition. And that's what I found so emancipating for myself personally to, there are basically three different Kaula traditions that I've been involved with. And just the fact that it's just so, in that sense, there's nothing, because it's not monastic, there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to... Uh, and where the whole idea of a kind of completely transpersonal love, of, of, you know, where each partner is Shiva Shakti, you know, where you see the supreme um, nature of both partners. And so that any kind of, you know, to, so to fall from that is to automatically, uh, you know, fall from the Kaula, to fall from this kind of uh, intentional community, which is based upon that pure vision. So that's, that's where I do see that, that going back to these historical roots of, of Tantra in India are, in a sense, help to give perspective on some of the ways, I think, in which Tantra in Tibet, in its monastic context at least, maybe arguably got off track, or at least turned into something different than it would have originally have been in an Indian context. Hmm. Fascinating. In terms of the Kaula groups that you were involved with, I'm curious how you were able to locate them. And also, what uh, could you discuss a little of your initiation into those groups? Uh, for example, were there any prerequisites for your initiation? You hinted in the previous episode at some of the uh, mechanisms of the initiation. To quote you, through the fluids, you're brought into an extraordinary intimacy with the Guru. That, uh, I think, is hinting at initiation uh, rites that are also present in uh, Tibetan tantric texts of a sharing of, for instance, sexual fluids with the guru um, mm -hmm. or via the consort or with the consort, some sort of configuration like that. This is um, mm -hmm. also, I think, in the Tibetan texts, uh, interpreted, of course, sometimes literally, sometimes metaphorically, as these things are. But so I'm curious how you became and how you were able to locate these groups. Were there any prerequisites for your initiation? And also, can you talk a little bit about the initiation process itself? Yeah, up to a degree, I can. Um, I'll just sort of preface it by saying that yeah, there's three different Kaula traditions that I was exposed to, and each one had its own, um, how'd you say, some you know, a, a particular qualities that, that in my experience, sort of, not that each one was successive, but each one had its own particular gifts and fruits. So one was in Assam, one was in Bengal, and one was in Andhra Pradesh in South India. Uh, so the one... Um, I'll, I'll speak about the one, the initiate, the, the formal initiation that I had in Assam first, which is actually less, in a way, crucial to the one in South India that we spoke about more last time. But it helps to frame it nonetheless, because um, it kind of, it was really my first inspiration um, to uh, sort of enter, engage with what were these. Um, these earlier uh, traditions of Indian Tantra that had um, become transformed in the Tibetan uh, experience and in Tibetan traditions. So I was living, uh, as I mentioned last time, in Kathmandu for a long time at that uh, during that period. And uh, but I'd been increasingly intrigued by uh, this an era, a place called Kamarupa in in which is in Assam. 
now associated um, with um, in Gauhati along the banks of the Brahmaputra River. Uh, <clears throat> and Kamakya is a temple of the, the goddess. Uh, Devi in the, in the largest sense, so Shakti, in other words, at least in the Tibetan, sorry, in the Indian tradition, Shakti, sort of the animating power of the universe, uh, which again, in Buddhist Tantra took it the other way around and made uh, Shakti was no longer the animating power, it was actually kind of the more passive, um, it was the emptiness, it was the supreme, you know, Prajnaparamita was the supreme space in which, in a certain sense, the male became the dynamic principle as compassion. So that, in a sense, also was an interesting historical twist, that a doctrinal twist, in fact, that kind of put the feminine principle in a different position. Um, but in any case, I had this inspiration to go to uh, Kamakya because this is again, you know, look at the, you may look at the larger kind of yogic tradition, Goraknath, Machendranath. So all of the tantric traditions of the Kathmandu Valley, which I'd been immersed in, uh, were said to have originally come from this sort of legendary world of Kamakya in Assam. And so I, I just had this deep inspiration to go to that place. And I think maybe as we spoke last time, I had the extraordinary, just fortuitous um, connection to, to arrive there. And immediately the person who, the connection that I had with the area was, was a woman of the Naga tribe who had nonetheless was a very, very prominent figure in local tele, in a very you know, highly erudite uh, woman who said, oh, you know, this great Tibetan master has uh, has arrived today as well as you. <laughs> Why don't, maybe you want to see him. I, said, well, I came here, you know, to kind of delve into the, you know, the Indian Tantra, but why not? So, but anyway, we stopped. He said, oh, well, it's right on the way. And so that led to this extremely um, wonderful re- introduction. I mean, I'd met him years before in, in Dehradun, Rajpur, uh, but with Sakya Trizin Rinpoche, you know, who had come to Assam very, very specifically to um, almost a, as, a, as a pilgrimage to look into these tantric Shakti Pitas, these places of the feminine power within the Kaula tradition, uh, which he believed were completely overlapped with the, 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 the 24 places described in the, in the Hevajra Tantra and in the Kala Chakra Tantra, which were of course very important, you know, Hevajra in particular within the Sakya tradition. And I said, well, essentially that's where I've come to. I said, you know, and he'd come with his family and his niece. And his, um, so I said, well, why don't we, you know, why don't we explore these together because he'd hired a, you know. Uh, so that meant for an amazing week um, in which my sort of subverted my original plans was to be able to go with him to places like, um, Hajo and all to this this Umana, um, this small island in the where he's performing uh, rituals out in the middle of the Brahmaputra, and he said, yeah, all of these were essentially this was the time when Hevajra and the Kaula, all of these were kind of a single nexus, and clearly, and as we as he, so part of the conversations we had, you know, at the ends of the day were about the role of Maituna and the five M's, which are of course the famous. Uh, transgressive practices, at least as they would have been transgressive for Brahmins at the time. And so, you know, again, we have to look at all of this so-called transgressive practice, or even as it was translated into essentially crazy wisdom in Tibetan tradition really only makes sense if you're living in an extremely um, orthodox, caste-bound, class-bound society. And so none, a lot of that is not really relevant in our lives today, you know, as those, you know, born in the 60s or later. <laughs> um, but anyway, with this initial introduction uh, to that part of the world, uh, that initial part of the introduction to that part of the world with through the eyes also of psychiatrism Rinpoche, it allowed me to really see that, you know, this deep interface between the Kaula, the Kaula Marg, as it's called, the path of the this sort of family unit as he was also traveling in himself. And um, the the really the the inner essence of the, the of Tibetan uh, tantric and Vajrayana traditions, and then so following that, and then when he left, that's when I had met in this process uh, had been up already to Kamakya, which is the great temple of one of these twenty four sacred places, the most important, at least as it's understood in the in the by the tradition, is the place where the yoni of Sati fell on earth, and that is the Kamakya temple. Um, and through another connection that I had in uh, of a, a scholar introduced me to, to a guru uh, at um, 
Kamakya, uh, with whom I sought you know, initiation into the Kalamar formally. And so that was a kind of formal um, um, initiation that then ended as, as the tradition does with a kind of ritual feast, uh, which we can also see the roots of the Gana Chakra in the, in the Tibetan, uh, or certainly first in the Indian Buddhist uh, tantric tradition, but then of course as it's practiced now, even in monastic contexts in the Tibetan tradition. And in that context, which was itself just, you know, beautiful bringing in his other core students, male, female, Bhairavas and Bhairavis, uh, the ritual feast involving, in some cases, what would have been in a Brahmanical context, transgressive substances, the meat, the alcohol, etc. And then, you know, his own oral explanation of the five M's, you know, the, the feet, the, you know, the, all of these substances, the, the meat, the fish, the wine, they have an inner uh, interpretation as um, an esoteric interpretation, but they are also, he said, very much on the exoteric level, they were they were substances that fed the body, that nourished the body, and in a certain sense culminated with the fifth M, which was Maituna, which was was ritual union. And he said, "Yeah." When I asked, you know, asked, he said, "Well, yeah, in the old old days, that might have involved, you know, a so-called chakra a circle in which the practices were conducted, in that sense, communally, um, because it was about transcendence of our the attachment that arises through desire." into a more expansive, almost celebratory and offeratory um, ecstatic passion, you know, almost really what we would think of in our own Western historical tradition, at least of a kind of Dionysian um, ecstatic intoxication in which the personal um, ego, egoic mind is, is transcended. But he says now, you know, now it's done in a, in a, as traditions change and, and, and in a way as they should, uh, that's, uh, done privately, <laughs> and um, because my the the you could say that initiation into the Kaulamarg, which was also connected at, in at Kamakya to the Das Mahavidya, to these ten the great wisdom goddesses, um, which are emanations of the great goddess, so including Tara, Kali, you know, Sundar, um, Tripura, Sundari, etc. Um, I was initiated into. And you know, basically, in that tradition, you would you, know, you would choose or have chosen for you one of the these these goddesses uh, that you would then relate to as a kind of yidam in, in in the Tibetan sense as a personal deity. And yet, the way he initiated me, he said, you know, if you if we initiate you know, to Shiva, then basically all the shaktis are included because Shiva is just you know again not it's not a god; it's just Shiva it means literally supreme consciousness. So again, partly it's you know because of, you know, from the Tibetan context, tends to denigrate the Shai, you know, the Hindu tradition by actually claiming that they worship gods. But, you know, when you're inside the tradition, you recognize that Shiva is just supreme consciousness and it's animated by Shakti and Shiva and Shakti are an inseparable unity and uh, that's nonetheless comprised of this dynamic, you know, polarity. So anyway, that was just to, that was my formal introduction. And, but then back in Kathmandu, there was another, I met another great, uh, Shaiva master, Shakta, really Shakta master, who of uh, that tradition, who, um, and I won't go into all the circumstances of that, but then who invited me to come down. He said, well, if you really want, you know, at that time, I was still very immersed in the Tibetan tradition, but as he referred to, he said, you know, that's just, you know, all that intellectual stuff is not really, you know, you won't, you won't find Tantra in books, you won't find Tantra in all of these kind of, uh, you know, complicated, um, things that your, you know, your Tibetan gurus are, are teaching you. That was sort of his almost dismissive way of, um, of responding, at least to what he saw as my limitations at that time. He said, if you really want to understand what Tantra is, come, come down to South India this winter and I will, you know, I will initiate you. So that, of course, was an invitation that couldn't be refused. Uh, because again, you know, it's one thing to keep going out to Bodhanath and, you know, when there's going to be another great empowerment given and, you know, all, you know, every monk sitting on one side and Western disciples and supplicatory mode as I was one of on another and, you know, going through these ritual procedures when you feel you're initiated into a practice and yet, you know, there's no personal contact really with the teacher. The teacher certainly wouldn't even be, you know, these were outer empowerments that had a sociological function and the historical function, certainly within a theocratic state that was Tibet. Um, but it wasn't really the essence 
uh, as I understood and knew, you know, even from Sakyatrism of the tradition. So going to South India was really a, um, the initiation, as I said, with Uma Devi. Uh, compl you know, long, complex. It involved, uh, how can I say, the preparation. Certainly, this teacher who I had been meeting over years um, in uh, who'd actually healed me. I mean, he had actual Siddhi, for sure. Probably the only teacher I've known who had overt, um, let's say, power over his inner circuitry, energy circuitry in the, in the body. Uh, I guess I have to explain that now. <laughs> so that's what actually why I was so intrigued by this particular teacher. And that happened back early on in 1984 when I first met him in Kathmandu. And again, I'd been studying Tibetan Buddhism. And he's again said, you know, what can these Tibetans tell you about, <laughs> you know, about, you know, Shakti? What can they tell you about your own inner you know, wisdom, your own nature. And he said that only comes through the awakening of Kundalini. That, you know, in Kundalini, as we know, and it was uh, essentially transmogrified in the Tibetan, sorry, in the Buddha, in Buddhist Tantra into Chandali. And Chandali as that sort of, literally, which also meant the kind of the, the um, they were actually also not just that inner principle of, of, of somatic, you know, psychic energy, but Chandali were also the ones who referred to as the outcast women who actually were bringing, holding around dead bodies and corpses at charnel grounds. So they were very, very powerful uh, beings that you had to kind of engage with uh, carefully, as, you, as is true also with the inner Kundalini. And then Chandali translated, of course, directly into Tumo um, in the Tibetan tradition, which we think of as inner fire, but literally means the fierce lady, the fierce feminine, the fierce woman. Um, so relating it directly to Chandali and then Kundalini, which is essentially uh, the two traditions. We see that even in the Kala Chakra Tridanta, we're all kind of conflated. Um, so in this case, this was what you know was being offered was to uh, uh, to come down to South India to really understand the uh, to be initiated into the the real nature of Tantra. So as I mentioned, one of the things that had first inspired me was this. Um, uh, what he showed me, which is, he said, well, you know, he says, there's nothing magical about Kundalini. It's really about through particular, you know, through practices, gaining um, um, conscious control over what we would consider autonomic um, functions of the nervous system, um, we, which we normally think of as heartbeat and breath. He said, yeah, that's on the outer level, but on an inner, inner level is gazing control over what we would now begin to understand only in the last couple of years, which maybe we can speak about later, this physoelectricity, which is, seems to now be the, the function. It's a, it's a parallel electrical circuitry within the human body, part of the interstitium, uh, and which is now sort of changing the whole way in which acupuncture, qigong, and these inner tantric practices can actually be understood. So it's harnessing that one can almost argue piezoelectricity, but certainly this inner energy in order to achieve demonstrable results. So when I challenged him, I said, well, all these city, you know, you hear about all this all the time. And this is back in 84. He goes, yeah, he said, that's what actually had said he had brought him to the path. And I said, well, so what do you, what do you mean? How, what evidence is there for any of these so-called city? Okay, so, okay, give me a, do you have a rupee? So back in those days, rupees, you know, you had the coin. So I took a coin out of my pocket, gave it to him, and he literally just put it between his fingers and uh, held it up essentially to his Ajna chakra, to his third eye, and just concentrated. It couldn't have been for more than, I don't know, 60 seconds. I mean, really a short time, maybe longer. I, it's hard to recall. Anyway, he did that. And I didn't know what this was all about. I said, okay, okay, open your palm. And so I opened my palm. He put the coin in the palm. He said, okay, close it. I, he said, no, no, keep it closed because there was this real electrical shock in, in, in my hand. I was like, no, just keep it closed. And then, you know, he continued to talk. And then, um, you know, again, I can't recall the, the substance of our conversation at that time, but after a certain point, maybe five minutes, um, possibly longer, he said, okay, how's your hand feeling now? I said, well, no, that kind of you know, electrical current sort of subsided. He says, okay, now open your hand. So I opened my hand, the coin is there. But so is probably at least a half teaspoon or more of ash. I'm like, what on earth? <laughs> he goes, no, no, nothing, nothing magical. 
he said, this is just, you know, when you connect that circuitry, essentially, in the, the shushumna, in the abaduti, the, basically the hypogonadal uh, axis, uh, but let's say the inner current that is there within that central axis of the body, he says, you learn to be able to reverse the polarity, depending on what you're trying to achieve. You can turn, you know, it's just like ACDC. And by doing that, you know, you can achieve results. He said, this is actually what, you know, Tantra, the, the guru's role is to do. He says, now, and you'll, and as I did, I felt this kind of, kind of energized clearing in the whole part of the arm. He said, this is what, again, in his critique, you know, of my, of what I was receiving, let's say in the Tibetan tradition, he said, the role of the guru, you take not just a, a, a coin, but particular um, metal alloys, and that would be as, as you, and then you would lie down and you would have those different metals uh, placed on the different chakras and the guru would charge them in that sense and clear you, clear your whole subtle nervous system of any kind of, you know, uh, impediments. And then, then as he sort of phrased it in his sort of usual way, kind of just open, you know, open you to the universe and leave you alone. <laughs> so in other words, not fill you with, with, uh, you know, con concepts. Because uh, again, the whole point, as he said in Tantra, is, to, is, is not to fill you up with more and more ideas and concepts, but to relieve you of them. So anyway, that's what you know, really made me enthusiastic about going down and uh, in, a, in, a, in a very one-on-one you know, -on -one situation being initiated into the practice. And so that involved you know, a, a long trip down to South India. May I interject? Yeah, uh, please do, please do, yes. You mm -hmm. mentioned that he healed you. Um, yes, let's just say, yes. So at the time when I met him, that was 1984, it was four years after I'd had a very, very serious uh, mountaineering accident, rock climbing accident in which was really almost, uh, yeah, ended my life. It, I, you know, period of, you know, from the multiple skull fractures and um, it, 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 uh, it was a long healing process. Um, but by the time I was able to travel back to Nepal, uh, I guess it was, I think this was actually not, sorry, not 1984, this was 1980, sorry, that was 1982, that this, this all happened when I first met him in Kathmandu. And so, of course, I was very, very, that was the first time I could really travel after healing to the degree that I did after the operations I'd had on my knee, my shoulder, the multiple skull fractures, and uh, which I was told I was never really going to be able to walk properly again. And um yeah so a very traumatic time uh so by being but then with the opportunity that i had to go back to um, um to asia to india and nepal and i guess this was 1982 and into 83 uh i was also on a healing mission uh, and i went to shamans and you know in kalimpong and i went to you know, originally to the Ayurvedic, you know, Dr. Mana Bajacharya in, in Kathmandu Valley, who I met first in 1977, and many things. And of course, then I heard, it was in that context that I heard about this Indian guru, you know, who was um, in, uh, in Kathmandu at that time. And I saw, and someone, I overheard a conversation actually in a, in a small little chai shop in Kathmandu. That's exactly how it happened. And then uh, through that, went to meet him and, um, you know, told him of my, you know, I was trying to sort of uh, cure myself of these re residual lingering um, you know, problems, that, uh, you know, including this incredible, you know, swelling in the knee and kind of internal circuitry problems. So anyway, so that was what began really as a, because he was known as a healer. And um, that led to, to a friendship at the same time. I could say, uh, but certainly, you know, because he also, his wife uh, was a Newar uh, woman. So I would go back in the evenings to, to eat with them at his, at, at the, it was actually originally her house. It was kind of a matriarchal tradition at Nardevi Tol, the goddess temple, uh, of which um, her clan lineage was connected to. So it was just suddenly this immersion uh, in, I'd come, you know, originally for Tibetan Buddhism, but found myself at that time, 1983. You know, very immersed in a very very close relationship with a with a shakta master, and the healing tradition that I that I referred to, he put me on very very <laughs> incredible sort of diet of of elixirs and um, some of which were rather volatile. You know, I'd have to go to the 
the market early in the morning and he'd had I mean, it's, it's embarrassing to admit that he said i had to uh buy fresh goat testicles and have them mashed up and uh, have that as my morning drink <laughs> part of it i think he was just testing my own you know you know how how open was i to to uh uh yeah to to exploring the boundaries of, of things um but in any case that and then the practices connected with food uh breathing you know some extraordinary breathing practices which i still do every morning connect you know and even when i drink my coffee um there's a way of doing he said you know the most effective pranayama you can do while you're having your mango lassi for example which was always a, and he himself almost ate no food but he drank uh kukuri rum uh, uh almost you know bottle a day but the way he says but it's all a question he said the way we drink it he says you know it's, it can be amrita it's an elixir uh but it's all about you know as he said you inhale i mean i won't go into the whole technique of it but there was a whole way in which when you drink uh, whether it's alcohol or not um you inhale you bring it down into your to your lower chakras and then you you spread it and he said the alcohol actually helps to to spread uh, uh prana and we know that also from the from the Chinese Taoist tradition too, that small amounts of alcohol can enhance the efficacy of particular substances, particularly when they're done in the context of Qigong. So anyway, that was where um, that all began. He, has, he was also used a very, very interesting system of acupuncture that he, with, with golden needle connected to the Tanmatra Tantra. So I basically just allowed myself to be experimented on. And as a result of that, you know, all kinds of energy shifts happening in my body. And at the same time, fascinated with this idea you know, in Tantra of this interface of healing and at the same time, the expansion of our, um, of awareness as it uh, interfaced with the autonomic nervous system on the one hand, but also with this, you know, which is the, of course, in the tradition, both as we have in Dzogchen, as well as in, in all these esoteric traditions of Tantra, of Turiya, the so-called, you know, this fourth state of consciousness beyond waking, dreaming, sleeping. And, you know, which in certain sense, certainly ha uh, has, parallels the idea of rigpa this idea of a of an inclusive state of consciousness that is not identified with the contents of consciousness but in a certain sense the field of consciousness in which thoughts and emotions arise so it was a very healing it was very powerful and it, but it was again only the years later that i had then had that opportunity to travel down to to south india uh, to go through uh, another process um which had which involved, as I think we spoke about perhaps last year, but just to kind of reiterate that in brief, uh, a process of fasting on, um, again, making in the morning elixir of onion, you know, onion juice and honey, which was all meant to sort of build up this, um, this circuitry of energy. And then Uma Devi, who was the assigned consort, um, who had an extraordinary you know, personal background, um, I think it was crushed, you know, crushed rose petals and crushed pearl dust. And again, this is to build up a polarity um, between the male and female energies um, so that when union occurs, uh, one is experiencing something that's transcendent of what we would normally experience just in, the, in, a, in a conventional male-female union based upon mutual desire. But in this case, it's mutual desire that's amplified by a kind of... Um, by a circuitry that has been, um, let's say, reworked, uh, well, not re really reworked, but this is intensified through uh, particular substances, supportive substances, as well as uh, supportive practices, the kind of pranayama that, uh, that we were all sort of doing together along with uh, the teachers, the guru's own uh, you know, instruction and guidance. And yeah, that was really the foundations for it. So very much it was, and then during that whole time, of course, this is why you know, I think all these practices were, you know, they're so-called secret, but it just meant that they really were to be conducted in that sense, intimately, privately, uh, because it doesn't really make sense to, to practice these things. I mean, we can, to a certain degree, there's things that can be drawn from the tradition and adapted, but certainly in my experience, it was this incredible, opportunity you know to have to work so intimately with a teacher who becomes like a father mother figure you know you really do feel that you're in a kula in a in a in a, in a family in, a, in an alternate family 
uh, and with all of the kind of obligations and implications that that involves. And that was the beauty, the power, and in a sense, the safety net of it, because as long as there is that implicit trust between the, you know, the, the disciple and the guru, then there's all you're not going to trip out. <laughs> uh, but all that depends, of course, on the teacher being, you know, um, someone that one trusts implicitly, and for the teacher to know that there's a student who, who is capable of, of sort of handling, as it were, the kind of intensified energies that all of the practices are there uh, to, to, to activate. But in my case, that's, that was really why it was such a, a gift. And, um, and as I said, when I, I think again last year, after that month or so that I spent there and went through the whole process, uh, and I, I reckon you know, going back to, 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 to Nepal and meeting with te my teachers there, um, I remember before I saw, I think Chatra Mujay was away at that time, I saw Tuku Urgyan first. Um, and you know, basically told him, you know, and he said <laughs> it was very, very interesting because um, he said, "Oh yes, yes, yes." He said, "You know, as long as one's had pointing out instructions, you know, then there's no limit to what practices one does." And he said, "Yeah, actually, in India, they 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 know yoga much better than we Tibetans do. It was too cold in Tibet to do a lot of these physical practices, and in, including the Karma Mudra practices, including the Maituna." He says that India was just. He said, "Like Nepal, it's a much better climate." Uh, for this kind of practices. And he said, even not just uh, in terms of you know, the geographical conditions, but even just the sociological conditions. So, because as we know, the Newar Tantra tradition is, is probably much, much closer to what Indian Tantra was than anything in the Tibetan Tantra. So it was very confirming. And I think, and then when, when I saw Chatram Shri asking very specifically about you know, some of the Tsalum, you know, basically the Tsalum Pranayama practices and his then sharing, you know, the fact that, you know, his own, after he'd come from Tibet and uh, originally in that whole area of Kalampong, Darjeeling, how he'd also had many, um, you know, interactions with, with Shakta masters and teachers and said, yeah, yeah so that's very good. So again, not to, he says, it's not about limiting. Uh, he said, you know, the path is not about limiting. And again, the same thing that once there's an understanding of this, of the nature of mind as not being in any way, um, uh, uh, something associated with what we identify as being personal. Uh, it's not our persona, in other words, it's not the ego, it's, it's, um, it's this kind of essence that goes beyond it, then yeah, there's nothing, our practice becomes whatever it is that supports that. So that was, you know, in a sense for me, the way these, uh, the Kaula and the Tibetan, particularly the Dzogchen traditions were, I really became mutually reinforcing in terms of what they both traditions were really um, striving, not striving for, because of course it's the effortless path. It's the one where, in other words, you, you give up effort because it's taking uh, delight and pleasure is no longer seen as problematic the way it is in the, in the Theravada tradition as something as the possible, uh, you know, that can trip us up with attachments and, and, and projections and all of that, but just basically as a, a more expansive a relationship with our desires and with our passions so that we they transform as the Kaula tradition will say very overtly you know from passion into into great love and this this mahasuka which probably would be the you know the the indian uh, buddhist tradition way of understanding it where bliss is transcendent of desire because bliss has no objective it's just a state of expanse expansiveness um, and which is therefore in an intrinsically altruistic because it seeks only to, to expand that bliss uh, into all phenomena. And then particularly with the partner, with the companion on the path, which in the Kaula tradition, the couple, the coupled relationship is, is more explicitly uh, important than it, than it could be within the Tibetan tradition because of the, the bias, you could say, towards, uh, a renunci towards renunciation that's there, at least within early Buddhism. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Mm. Chatra Rinpoche asked you for details of the various breath holds and pranayama techniques that you experienced there in that Kaula context and was very interested in that comparative approach. I'm wondering if you could share some of that comparison here in the areas perhaps to do with the Trukor or Asana. I don't know if there's interesting comparison there or certainly with the pranayama or even in the uh, 
Kundalini or Chandali practices. I'm wondering if there's a comparison that you can offer there between the kinds of practices we see in Tibetan yoga and that you write about in your book, Tibetan Yoga, sure. um, uh, and the practices you experience in the Kalu tradition. And also, I must ask as a postscript, what is the Mango Lassi Pranayama? Is, uh, <laughs> is that something you said you, you, were, you weren't going to go into details? And I don't know if that was because of brevity or secrecy. If it's the no, former, no, no, I, please, uh, uh, yeah. could you reveal it? Well, I'll share both. And so let's, let's, we'll start with the Mangalasi Pranayama, uh, which can be applied even to uh, Rotgut uh, uh, Nepalese rum <laughs> or, or, or any other, basically any other substance. But why, uh, in this case, this guru mentioned why he said uh, Mangalasi is particularly effective is because of the, um, uh, the viscosity of it. So in other words, a mango lassi has this thickness. It's like a, like kefir, probably kefir would be the closest, you know, which you can pick up at any Whole Foods uh, or the equivalent anywhere, uh, would have that same thick substance where it's sort of halfway between solid and liquid. So the basic technique, and then I'll, we'll talk about the other thing was essentially as he, as he transmitted it, you know, you inhale through the nose and then let's just say if this, if this mug of, of coffee was my, uh, my, uh, Mango lassi, you'd then you switch from nasal breathing to as you in almost as if you were inhaling through the mouth your mango lassi or your coffee uh, or your cappuccino, whatever it might be. And then you you swallow and you basically track the swallowing. And that's again why the more viscid it is, let's say if it was a thick, if it was a cappuccino made with a, you know. With whole cream as opposed to um and it basically it's as we also see this in the Taoist tradition the idea of swallowing the saliva and also as we know from the Taoist as well as the kala tradition the more saliva there is that you can actually bring down this is actually has a kind of transformative effect on the whole uh, energy circuitry in the body so with the um the mango lassi pranayama you bring it down and you're holding it essentially in your lower abdomen so in the uh the, the dantian, as we would think of it in the, in, you know, the, the elixir field, which is probably the, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the cinnabar field, which, uh, and then, but what you've done, so what, you know, you have this, of course, in these various traditions, the holding also in the Tibetan tradition of Tumul, swallowing down into this point, four finger widths below and behind the navel, as it is described in the Tumul tradition. But through that, process of supporting the saliva with a similarly viscid substance, in this case, you know, the mango lassi, um, you actually become more adept at uh, bringing that energy down. Uh, so that, that was sort of the, the idea behind it. And then, of course, that was done in a more intensified way with the, the combination of onion juice and honey that I had to drink. And that, you know, when I think about that now, it's a little bit like, I don't know if anyone, you know, have experience of, of high doses of niacin, for example, can bring about this incredible flush, a niacin flush that's just supposed to, again, have a kind of, it can clear the, according to some uh, theories, it can kind of clear the nadis um, because you get this flush and you can actually use it in the, in the context of certain practices to, as a supportive substance, just as a pure, pure niacin. Um, but in the context of the onion juice and honey, you get both the heat, the burning sensation that you get from the onion, and then the soothing effect of the honey, but you have the same kind of um, viscosity. So we, so we did the same, I did the same technique then in uh, consuming that, but that would just bring really a kind of fire in the belly in a very literal sense. Uh, your whole body just felt like it was, you know, it was on fire because of the onion juice. And then you would assimilate that. The whole idea was that you enter into these kind of expanded states, you know, and you don't trip out on them, but you actually just then by resting in the nature of the mind, uh, those states become normalized and at the same time integrated on a, where at a level in which your experience of embodied being becomes somewhat more, ex not accelerate, well, no, yes, I mean, expanded in that sense. May yeah. I uh, mention? Please. So you mentioned that one inhales through the nose, and then you said, and you switch from nasal breathing, switching to what? To drinking or? Well, to, to to basically breathing through the mouth, but the breathing through the mouth is simultaneously a, a process of swallowing. So it would be, 
Yeah. So basically where you switch from nasal breathing to a, an inhale that's also inseparable from, from the swallowing process. Let's just say, so you're the way you would breathe in and swallow down. You're just, you're enhancing that effect through, through the addition of a viscid substance. Um, and particularly, again, that can be enhanced. And it was just because when he was first teaching that technique, he said, mango lassi is good. But then, you know, the inner, the, the, the later instruction was, you know, was the honey and onion juice, for example. And then there were other, you know, other substances that could be used in a similar way. And in his case, rum. <laughs> and the holding at the Dantian, is that accomplished by uh, force of attention? Or is it combined with breath holding and Bumba Chan or something of that nature? Yeah. In his case, he didn't really give too much attention to that. He just said, because oh, I would ask, well, how long do I hold it? He said, don't, don't, he says, you know, don't fill your mind with these you know, kind of psychic, you know, sort of these concepts, you know, just however long it's comfortable, depends on the circumstances, da da da, you know, don't, you don't, it's not a, and, but then certainly as we, uh, you know, in the context of later teaching, when I did ask that in the context of the honey and onion juice, he said, yeah, no, it's a subtle, you're pressing down the, you know, it's the apana prana, prana apana kind of combustion, if you will, that happens in that cinnabar field uh, you know, below the navel, which is also, of course, the site where Chandali and Kundalini arise from. But in this case, it was actually with when, because the practice we did with the honey and the, um, it was interestingly a little different. So rather than pulling up on the muladhara, as you would do under the, context of uh, tumo practice chandali practice or even kundalini in some cases he said no 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 this in this case the open that lower gate bring the energy all the way down and it actually is meant to sort of fill your sexual organs so with whether you're female or male it would be the same process he says don't if you pull up you know this is again this is this is favoring you set up a kind of automatic um circuitry um in in you know the biofield if you will um by doing that that subtle intention of pulling up on the perennial floor perennial floor um but uh, he said in this case you're actually wanting to really infuse the lower the lower chakras in this case also the secret chakra as it would be called um with with the energy of that substance you know the honey and the onion juice and so you actually will release it i said well isn't that doesn't that drain you know isn't the energy just then ebb away from the body he says you know don't <laughs> don't get so conceptual he says you know if, if that ha you know it's not going to happen the more important thing he says is to bring that energy down as low as possible so it fills your in this case as he literally referred to it it fills your lingam fills your testicles fills your lower chakras until you're infused by that energy don't don't be you know nervous about the sense it's all going to get lost first you want to fill it um and then you begin then he said the circulation upward will happen naturally uh, through the practice. And so again, it was an interesting way. And I said, well, what about, do I visualize that? He says, no, no, he said, you know, really, he said, this is all your Tibetan conditioning. He said to visualize, he said, yeah, we have, you know, that's there in the Kala, but he said, watch all the, he said, the Kala is all about sensation. And he says, you work with sensation, not with, he said, you know, as he put it, you know, sort of visualization, it's like you're bypassing. It's basically becomes, we talk about spiritual bypassing, but in his sense, it was almost as if he was talking about somatic bypassing. So in other words, you become, he said, visualization can lead you into just, essentially he didn't use the word, but almost dissociative states where you're no longer kind of actually connected with your body. You're actually kind of in an alternate universe of conceptual imagination. And he said, that's the very opposite of Tantra, he said. So I found all that being a very interesting to then bring back into my the practices of Tumo and the practices of, you know, that I've been, and then discuss those, you know, with, with Tibetan teachers. And they said, yeah, yeah, no, that he said that they said, yeah, of course, you know, he said, yeah, visualization is for beginners, you know, which is literally what I won't even name the names because it becomes complicated. Um, but essentially also what psychiatrism mentioned. And he said a lot of even mantra, he said, this is just a way of, trying to control thoughts and emotions if it doesn't, if you haven't naturally um, entered uh, the central channel as a metaphor, if you will, for the nature of mind consciousness as being transcendent of, of, of thought and emotion, not in any way that it's opposed to it, but that you're in a different state of flow. Um, and mantra can help to entrain the mind towards that, but it can also at a certain point becomes a disservice to it. And I said, that's, he said, that's why it's very important. And I think that's something worth mentioning because in the Kaula, they really emphasize that mantra is not recited, you know, as we often see in Tibetan tradition, it's spoken out loud as if the deities are hearing you and that they need to hear you, whereas all internal. 
in the Kaula traditions. So that basically it sets up a subtle, you know, the nada, it's closer to the nada, tradition of nada, where what you're doing is tuning in to a spontaneous internal vibrant uh, frequency uh, through the use of a, of a uh, often a single uh, seed mantra, seed bees mantra, like om kling, 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 you know, that we have in the shakti tradition. And that that creates this sort of vibratory field that, that opens and clears the channels, as opposed to a more the way mantras sometimes used in a popular way, let's say in the Tibetan tradition, almost as a supplicatory, invocatory uh, prayer towards a deity that has become objectified and to some degree is concretized, uh, which is really not, of course, the way that they were originally understood and conceived of uh, in their more esoteric sense. So I shared, you know, with Chantra Mishri, of course, the, the kinds of pranayama practices since he was interested, um, you know, that I'd had, you know, learned within this, uh, you know, the, the Shaiva tradition or Shakta tradition, as it literally was. And, uh, you know, he paid really close attention. I found it very, very interesting. And so, of course, there were a lot of parallels with the way such salung, which is essentially pranayama or qigong uh, practices are done in the Tibetan tradition. But I also emphasized again, the fact that it was based on sensation rather than visualizing anything. He says, no, very good. Um, and that, um, um, that it worked also a lot with an experience of, uh, I said, you know, with, with this idea of inner uh, prakash, you know, what they call the inner luminosity, uh, and Prabhasvara. And, and I said, and again, I said, you know, I was again trying to make sure that he understood that I saw the parallels between, because Kaula tradition is very much all about the heart also. So when we think of Dzogchen, it's, it's often short for Dzogchen Nintik, the, the essence of the heart, the heart essence teachings, which means not just the kind of the essential teachings, but also it's very much based on a heart-centered consciousness. A consciousness that's no longer sort of, you know, uh, head-based, but in a sense, this much more expansive and, and heartful awareness. And that's certainly what Kaula emphasizes too. And he said, no, absolutely. And again, it's because he himself was very much uh, aware of and um, cognizant of the way the Shaiva traditions are practiced. And I think he was personally very, you know, we see a lot, you know, as we understand, you know, as we know, in religious converts of one kind or another, we tend, tend to be more fundamentalist than those who are brought up in a tradition. So we unfortunately see that quite often in the Western converts to, to one religion or another, and it's not absent in Tibetan Buddhism either to somehow then denigrate Shaivites, you know, they're all worshiping gods, and they're all tripping out on bliss states, and therefore don't understand the true nature of mind, which is transcendent of bliss. But then we sort of ignore the iconography of Dzogchen and the very fact that bliss is actually you know, an intrinsic part of it. The chit, you know, sat chit ananda, you know, the, in the being and the supreme consciousness and bliss that we have in the, you know, in the tantric Shaiva traditions of India is really not really different than the, you know, the than uh, the three bodies of, of the of, of Buddha nature, in which the Buddhist uh, siddhas refer to as mahasukha, as the great bliss, which essentially transcends samsara or, or eclipses it. So anyway, um, so what Chantra Mishri was very, so I asked, you know, I said, well, how do I integrate these practices with what I do as well? Uh, and I think this is probably something very helpful. Um, the, the core practice, as, as anyone probably who has been exposed to the Dzogchen tradition knows, is that, you know, once there's the, 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 you've, are, practices, not just the pointing out instructions of the teacher, but the practices themselves that actually put us into the natural state. And that's very important. And Chachram Shri also always emphasized that. He said, you know, your own teacher is your own, you know, it's here, it's in your heart mind. And so the practices that I'm giving you are to point out and to bring you in and train you essentially into that state so that, you know, you're self-sufficient, which is the whole point. Self-sufficient, not in some limited and solipsistic way, but in a way in which the whole duality and dependency that sometimes comes into place in, let's say, dysfunctional uh, guru-disciple relationships isn't, isn't there. Um, the guru just becomes another extension of your own understanding of the nature of reality and, you know, a, you know the great mentor um, and who can help correct any misunderstandings that might arise. So because the teachings from Chachar Mishay had always been so focused on, you know, on Rikpa, on resting and then not resting in the nature of mind, which I think, again, resting is also implies a passivity, but it's basically the pure presence of the nature of mind. And when the presence of the nature of mind there, which is a transpersonal state, when that state is present, then there's no limitation 
on any level. And he has specifically said there's no limitation in terms of the kind of practice that you engage in that makes that presence more present, if you will, more palpable, more, more expansive. And so this is the way that you kind of, even though Rigpa itself is transcendent of these kind of energetic states that the Salon Qigong practices bring about, at the same time, it can be empowered. And so his kind of core teaching in this regard was, because I said, well, how do I, one does own reconcile, you could say the effortless spontaneity of Sahaja, which essentially uh, is Dzogchen, uh, and we can talk about that, uh, which I think is very important to look at the roots of Dzogchen, uh, you know, with these kind of more energizing practices of Salam, uh, uh, which we see as the, at, the, at the roots of the practices of Kundalini and Chandari and Tumo. And he said, no, he said, very, very simple. You just, you, the core practice is, you know, bringing that state of the presence of the nature of the mind into all activities, whatever it might be. But if, if that ever seems to be, you know, flagging, and then you, you'll do some of the, you know, the breathing practices, uh, the Tsalum practices. And he said, you know, again, and it, it, you know, it doesn't need visualization. It needs really, it's about sensation. And that sensation then expands into, to awareness, you use the sensation as the gate into to expansive awareness, um, and then rest in the nature. You know, to use the kind of conventional ways understood, rest in the nature of the mind, be in the nature of mind uh, until such time that you need to re re engage. Um, and so, again, using it therefore always as a supportive practice and not as something that is a is a it's an adjunct practice that can be used circumstantially and situationally as needed, but that the ultimate practice the supreme practice is, is, is no practice. It's just being in that state of presence, but recognizing when that presence is in a certain sense lost, um, if, if it can be so, or let, let's say at least obscured and then finding the right practice, whatever it might be to bring you back into that state of non-dual presence. That's very fascinating indeed. I'm curious uh, about, um, well, much of that, but to be um, technical again, mm. when you re, uh, reported to Chattel Rinpoche the difference in the Mulabanda activation in mm -hmm. terms of the uh, breath hold practices, and this is perhaps a pedantically technical question, what was his response uh, to that? And in your own explorations, this is something also that you reported in the last interview with your encounter with John Tang. John Tang, yes, the John Magus Chang. of Dava. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. He also was uh, of the opinion of your Kerala master of the uh, softening of the base of the body as opposed to the uh, bracing of the base of the body that we find in typical Tumo instruction. Yeah. When you reported that to Chacha Rinpoche, what was his reaction to that, it seems, quintessential aspect of Tumo practice? Yes, um, very, very, I like the question. Um, so as I can recall, um, yeah, when I did bring up that specific aspect, which is a very, I think it's a very subtle, but very important one, because this idea of how we work with the perennial floor is um, kind of a perennial, if we want to call it that issue within all of these esoteric traditions. Uh, and um, Tumo in particular, at least in its Tibetan iteration uh, is normally, uh, done with a subtle um, pulling up, not a forceful, but a subtle pulling up on the perennial floor, at least of the way I've been instructed. Um, but it's always emphasized that it's subtle, not, not to be overdone, because that can, again, imbalance the nervous system, but the idea is to bring the energy down. And so, as you mentioned, John Chang and the Magus of Java in the Le Shen Dao tradition, uh, in, the, in the Chinese Taoist tradition, it's about the more, it's, 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 as John Chang says, he says, he's he he kind of shaking his head. He said, you know, Westerners, you Westerners are all in the head. He says, he's like, why do you want to bring the energy up? It's about bringing the energy down. So, you know, in a wonderful and playful way, kind of just, you know, really corrected the imbalance. And I think this is very true. And I think, you know, there is the kind of misconception sometimes that we've inherited from a kind of bias that up is good and down is bad. But as we know, and Tantra reverses that in a certain sense that, you know, unless you ignite the fires, you know, the kindling of the, the base of our embodied existence, then what's above, as it were, can't flow. And again, just to use a beautiful metaphor in the Gnostic 
tradition, they talk about the, you know, the, 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 the rising fire and the flowing waters. And I like that particular idiom, if you will, because the idea is that the upper chakras don't flow uh, unless the lower chakras have been properly kindled. So to do that, if we just think of as a fire, you know, at the base of the body, you know, yes, we need to fan the fires, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to kind of, uh, you know, first you want to, you don't want it to sort of, the fires don't, you want them, don't want them to extinguish upward. So the idea is really kindle, you know, making sure that kindling is all completely, uh, you know, in the sense that combustion has fully taken place before you begin to to bring the energy up, and that's also very true in the in the various traditions of of uh, tumo that I've been exposed to, where you know you don't begin to bring it up through the other chakras, through the through the core of the body, until it's fully ignited. Uh, in the that space, you know, for when your finger widths and for and behind the navel as well. So at the core of the body there. Um, so that I think is also both, you know, I brought that up with Sakichism Rinpoche, Chatra Rinpoche, um, as well as you know, a Buddhist master in Bhutan, uh, who was a very adept in the Tsalong Tigli. And as I, I, actually just to bring up his example, uh, as has he expressed it, he said, yeah, we, we forget when we think of Tsalong practice, it's actually Tsalong Tigli practice. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. So Tsalong meaning uh, nadi, prana, nadi Prana, but it's Nadi Prana Bindu, Tsalong Tigli. So he says, actually, the whole point of the tsalung is to is to is to work with the bindu, and you know, in a certain sense, it's the uh, the foundation for and, and that the essence ultimately is the bindu, which is tigle, which can be understood as kind of the principle of bliss in the body. In other words, it's connected with with consciousness, but it's also connected with subtle essence in the body. And so, if we remember that the bindu is the important part, then um, yes, then then not. It's not about circ, you know, we don't, you know, it's the red and the white. I mean, there are just many, many ways of, of understanding that circuitry. But the point is to fully, uh, you know, it's like we have in the Hevajra Tantra, for example, there's the yoga of passion before you have the, the more explicit practices of the Karma Mudra or Maituna. Because the idea is that you have to, you know, the passion has to be fully awakened before you start to do anything with it. Uh, and in that case, you know, it's not about just drawing it up, it's about bringing it down. And I think this is something that, particularly in our kind of contempt, overly intellectual Western context, is important to remember that the, the, the power and the beauty of these embodied practices is, is, is not to get uh, too conceptual about them, but actually, it's why I always you know, do, as I think we did last time, bring up the example of, you know, of Dionysus riding on a leopard you know, with his staff, you know, and how that, in a way, is reminiscent of Padmasambhava riding on a tigress. It's this whole idea of you know harnessing. Uh, yeah, we we look at it as in other words as being able to tame volatile energies in the body, but more than that, it's about riding them, working with them skillfully. So it's riding the tiger, it's it's riding the leopard, um, in the midst of uh, all of these ascendant power energies and powers, not getting carried away with them, but but in a certain sense, uh, not in any way trying to suppress them either. And I think again we have to always beware of that bias somehow within early Buddhism that these energies are to be avoided, they're volatile. And we have to always remember, therefore, in the Four Noble Truths were not the Noble Truths, they were the Four Truths for the Noble Ones who had renounced the world. And that they weren't for the, they weren't for the every, you know, for everyday population, they were for those who had made that choice not to engage um, you know, in, in worldly passions and therefore would they those four noble truths would reinforce the idea that that the world is pervaded by dissatisfaction or discontent you know dukkha and that that is based upon tanha this kind of craving grasping or thirst for for experience and, and grasping after passions but that's not the way of tantra so as we know the four noble truths in a certain sense are overturned you know, of course, they're there in the in the, the background uh, and they have their own tantric iterations, but ultimately the you know it's a it's a noble view of tantra is that you know you're taking the result as the path so you start that all life is pervaded by bliss and it's only when we fall from that that we fall into kind of samsaric mindsets so again you've you take the result and you put that back in its first place and i think that's something that we wonderful to talk about on a future occasion because 
uh, I just wanted to mention in brief what I think is a really fertile area that I think some scholars, particularly female scholars, are beginning to look at more and more, is you know really what was tantra like in uh, in Udiana, you know, which is this you know that you could say the the seabed from which the tantras arose that was on the ancient Silk Roads between you know the east and west, as it were. We know that there were traditions of, of, of Dionysus there even before Tantra arose. And we know that some of the earliest Mahasiddhas, like Lakshminkara, a female Mahasiddhas, she's said to be the sister of Indra Bhuti, uh, also writes in her, you know, her um, Sahaja Siddhi, you know, the, the realization of non-duality, um, Advaya Siddhi, is that there was a long, there was a line of, of both male and female teachers prior to her whose teachings we know relatively little about, but the way in which her own teachings and those of Sahaza Chinti Yogini uh, all are referring to core tantric practices involving partnered sexual practices with the orientation of Sahaja, of this sort of spontaneous natural state of non-duality, which really is there at the heart of the Kalo tradition and the heart, of course, in the very essence of the, um, the Dzogchen tradition. And it really is about the, you know, the, the emancipation of the heart so that it's not a, a, a grasping, but an expansive, radiant source of love and um, engagement uh, with the world. Uh, so I think looking at some of these overlooked female uh, tantric masters uh, from Udiana, where the Shaiva traditions, Shakta traditions, and Buddhist traditions were all uh, interfacing each other you know, from before the eighth century when Padmasambhava left Udiana to travel to, to, to Bhutan and Tibet, I think is a really, really important to look at in terms of, you know, where we can as Westerners situ understand uh, the practice uh, of, you could say, core Tantra, if you will, uh, because it did certainly arise at the nexus of these, not just Shaivism and Buddhism, but also of our own sort of Western Hellenic Dionysian traditions um, that we can understand in a more kind of, I think, sophisticated way uh, by looking at them in, in uh, kind of through an interdisciplinary approach that takes into account the Kaula and, uh, and the Buddhist Vajrayana. Mm, fascinating. I think that is, as you say, fertile ground for a third discussion. And in fact, uh, I have a whole battery of lines of inquiry just on that that we didn't get to. So if you'd be willing, I think it would be wonderful to have a third a conversation. I would love to. I think that would be, I, I think, as you say, that's a very, very, it's an important area to, to visit um, as we begin to understand, you know, where, where we take these practices as we move forward uh, in a transnational, transcultural tantra for the 21st century. When you mention uh, the female scholars, you mentioned some, you had in mind some female scholars who are doing particularly good work on that. Which names come to mind? Well, I think first Miranda Shaw, I think her book, uh, Passionate Enlightenment, was, which was done already many years ago, is um, yeah, in some ways has not, I mean, of course, she makes a very strong claim that Tantra, Buddhist Tantra, you know, was, was originated by female teachers and masters. And, you know, there, there are certainly indications of some of that, but sometimes it's, it's, it overreaches uh, in, in claiming, let's say, almost a matrilineal uh, origin of Tantra, which I think maybe isn't exactly as it is. I think it really is a more of a, a Shiva Shakti. It's more of a partnered and paired um, genesis. But I think at the same time, there's tremendous resources um, that she brings out in her book, Passionate Enlightenment, that, that uh, other scholars are now beginning to tease out and look at uh, to see where some of uh, uh, what might have been overlooked. So another academic uh, who has done very interesting work in this regard is uh, Ulrich Timmy Krag. Um, and I think he's in the University in Poland, if I'm not mistaken. And he's done a few very good academic papers on looking at female lineages and the poetry of some of the female Mahasiddhas of Udiana. Um, like Lakshminkara, Sahaja Chinta Yogini, uh, as well as others. Uh, and I think that those, those provides a very inter, uh, important resources for some for, to look at. And then more recently, Adele uh, Tomlin, you know, she has her website called uh, Dakini Translations. And so she's begun to look at the work, particularly of Miranda Shaw, um, and to follow up on some of those areas 
to look particularly as I think a recent post of hers did to you know who were these female teachers of the Mahasiddhas like for example you know we know you know we have so many stories about Virupa you know for example but we don't know much about uh, you know the the female teachers to which, uh, you know, and, and, and the same with Saraha, for example, you know, we have the classic story where, you know, he goes into 12 years Samadhi uh, uh, and then comes out of it. And the first thing he asks for is his radish soup, you know, and then this sort of, in some ways, anonymous female figure whose name we never know says, you know, how is it that you're, you know, what, what use was your 12 years of meditation if the first thing that comes to your mind when you emerge out of it is, is your, your radish soup. So, we, and then of course that sort of brings him to, to, a kind of Kensho awakening experience. And yet we know so little about these, in some ways, unnamed women who lie behind the great masters. And the same, I think, with the green yogini of Udiana, who was supposedly uh, Tilopa went off to, to Udiana to and sought instruction or received instruction from. So, um, so those are just three, uh, you know, Miranda Shaw, uh, uh, Ulrich Timmy Craig, Adele Thompson, I think now beginning to go through what I think is interesting about her work is that she is referring to some of the source material that uh, Miranda Shaw quotes, but going back to the original texts, so as to bring about, uh, I think, a more a deeper inquiry into the very into the nature of these teachings, uh, particularly of this idea of sahaj sahajiana. So, in that sense, when we look at you know the, the, the eighty four Mahasiddhas, Saraha, you know, being kind of the great patriarch, if you will, of all of the or the, the source Siddha. And you know, his takeaway of Mahamudra was Sahaja, was the Sahajananda, the bliss, the spontaneous bliss that arises. Um, and uh, then we see how that transformed in terms of Sahajayana, um, not just in the Vaishnava tradition in Bengal, but possibly really as a kind of source for the later iterations of Sokshin in Tibet. So yeah, those are just some beginnings, I think, of work that I hope other scholars will begin to look at. I'll just mention at the very end of that, there was a very interesting conference recently uh, looking at overturning this, this, what they call the greater Magadha uh, concept, which is looking at a whole different version of, uh, you know, we've, we've inherited this, this view for a long time of the so-called Aryan invasion of India and the, the bringing of the Vedas and the you know, subjugation of the Dravidians um, and with therefore the Aryan supremacy, if you will, connected with the Vedas. But a very, very interesting conference called the, uh, which occurred recently, and I can't remember the name of the, the scholar who introduced it, but there's this whole emergent theory that's based upon DNA research, fascinating, which is showing that actually this, this, uh, this migration from Anatolia, so greater Turkey, uh, through you know, uh, Bactria, um, Afghanistan, what's now Pakistan, was actually led by women, pastoralists. So we don't know what quite happened in Anatolia at that time, but it looks like this original uh, populating of the, the Northeast frontier was, um, uh, was women uh, bringing uh, their, their animals and therefore the milk that came from the animals. Uh, and that a lot of this may have actually even tied into even traditions that we associate with uh, you know, the, the Vedic, the Soma sacrifice, et cetera. So that is something that yeah, perhaps we can look at, you know, in another, another instance, this, I, I'll, I'll uh, follow up on that, looking at these early, the female migration, female led migrations into the area that we now connect with the uh, kind of source region for the Tantras, the connection there also with Soma, which as I mentioned, uh, is something that I've been doing research on, not just in terms of the earlier theories, but of a living tradition uh, of Soma in, uh, in Bengal, uh, based upon 64 different ingredients, some of which are psychoactive, some of which are synergetic, but non-psychoactive, but very much uh, part of a tradition of what they call the Nilkanta Tara, which they held to be a Buddhist uh, Tara, uh, coming from what they call Mahachin, so from Tibet. So basically a, a Buddhist Tara-based uh, tradition of Shakta, uh, sorry, of Soma uh, manufacture and consumption in a ritual context leading to Turiya, to this fourth state of consciousness. So yeah, we can talk about some of that you know, uh, next time perhaps. Excellent, that sounds fantastic. Dr. Regan Baker, thank you very much. My pleasure indeed, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. 
For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.